section. Uh, so, okay, anyway, Buddha's Dhammapada. It's written in the 4th and 5th century BC. Graves are attributed to Gautama, uh, who you know is uh, what's often called the first Buddha. Okay, so the book consists of just a number of, you know, small phrases, so forth. Um, it's really quite good, but in my opinion, the American uh, reader of the book might get a little bit impatient with it. Uh, because in sort of the fashion that the Zen masters write, it's not directly telling you. Uh, what it's really saying, it's speaking in metaphor, often, we're just speaking indirectly. Uh, so that's why it's, that's why I'm covering it now in the class, after we've talked about Buddhist physics and Buddhist psychology in India, I think that covering those first and then covering the Buddha's work, which is of course the principal thing we have to cover in a Buddhist philosophy class, uh, is a good way to, it's the proper way to do it, uh, in order to understand what the Buddha was saying. Um, okay, so, on these notes here that I gave you, it's like, oh yeah, so if you don't have a handout, there's a six-pager right there. Um, cool. uh, so the first page of the notes, then, I want to show that I want to discuss Buddhist physics. Uh, and then Buddhist atomism in the Buddha's work, you can see it right in there. If you know uh, the something about the philosophy of Nirvana uh, or quantum philosophy, quantum science, that we've been talking about. So uh, verses, so right at the very start of the book, verses one and two. Um, yeah, so the book goes by verses, by the way. You know, here's the first unit or section. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, that's how people usually talk about it. So, the very first uh, um, the very first section here reads as follows. The very first verse reads, what, are we, what we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday, and our present thoughts build our life tomorrow. Our life is a creation of the mind. Now, it would seem to me that that sounds exactly like our theory of time, where you have what uh, you know you have something like memory in division two consciousness, not division one nirvanic consciousness, and division two consciousness is building up its present state of existence out of memories and expectations. But nevertheless, it's all a creation of the mind, and it's all present thought. So that's pretty interesting. Um, Okay, now, so, and what, what I wrote here on your notes for you is these verses appear to be references to our theories. Present memory builds our consciousness, our ordinary consciousness. Okay. Um, now, on to Buddhist atomism. Uh, which, of course, it's uh, discussed quite well in uh, the Buddha's work. It's possible that... Um, Discussing uh, Buddhist atomism in terms of the Buddha's writings gives a very novel way to look at what the Buddha had to say because, uh, as far as I know, not a lot of people are discussing Buddhist atomism today in academia. In any, they're just discussing it in terms of the ancient Buddhist philosophers like Dara Kirti, uh, and they're not giving any new. Uh, analysis in terms of quantum, you know, comparing it to the quantum science. Because quantum science usually is discussed, actually I've said this before, but usually quantum reality is discussed as being not atomic, not made of irreducible uh, pieces of energy, irreducible pieces of reality, which is sort of amazing. That meteorological nihilism paper that we went over in this class that I published, that you can see in that paper that I'm trying to go against that trend show that the empirical observations show that it is atomism that is found in quantum reality. And it's the interpretations that of quantum reality that took us away from that. So interpretation being something that takes us away from empirical observation. So anyway, right in the Buddha's um, 
writings on page 46, or, I'm sorry, verse 46. Uh, let's see what 46, oops. Maybe turn to the page. Okay, here's 46 right here. He who knows that this body is the foam of a wave, the shadow of a mirage, he breaks the sharp arrows of Mara, concealed in the flowers of sensuous passions, and unseen by the king of death, he goes on and follows his path. Okay, have I talked about Mara ever in this class? That's just sort of a, uh, uh, like a mythical, it's a strictly, Mara has several names. There's, there's a Mara in Indian philosophy, in Indian mythology, and there are a number of Maras that show up in religious texts, but in Buddhism specifically, Mara has, is a uh, very, the unique Mara in Buddhism is sort of a demonic-like creature that comes to the Buddha uh, before he attains nirvana in order to tempt him into uh, you know, worldly joys. You know, the six-pack America <laughs> uh, lifestyle. You know, to drink 12 beers and watch TV, uh, you know, that's supposed to be earth, you know, joyful rather than to seek nirvana. Um, so anyways, this, so what I'm concerned with here though, mainly, is this right here, the foam of a wave. Now, let's see, I've got a picture of wave foam here on the computer for you. Uh, oh wow, look at that. Look at this picture. Um, okay, so anyway, here's the sea foam right there. Uh, so it forms patterns and is indistinguishable uh, from, say, this, say, for example, this part here to this part here. You can't distinguish pieces of ocean foam from other pieces. Now, you can find a, uh, there's a better picture of this. Seafoam is supposed to be, I mean, you're supposed to think of something that is just there for a second. It's just fleeting, uh, there for a moment, and it's a brilliant yellow or white, most often white, and uh, it sort of bubbles up and then, you know, out of the water itself and then uh, disintegrates and falls back into the water. So that's, um, that's how I uh, take um, the Buddha's piece discussing uh, division one reality. He's comparing it to sea foam, I would say. Because he says, the person who knows, he even knows the body is the foam of a wave. So and we're going to have later in, uh, passages from Buddha where he shows that the body is uh, not the only thing that's foam of a wave. In fact, everything is either burning flames or it's fire or boiling water or wave foam. All these things have a similar uh, characteristic to them, which is namely that uh, they're all fleeting. You can't distinguish pieces and parts of the substance in question. It exists just for a moment and is re the fleetingness is such that um, the flame will be replaced by another flame an instant later. The sea foam will be replaced by more sea foam an instant later. So, so let me read what I have here in these notes for you. There are a number of critical, uh, critical verses about flickering, vibrating reality. The first we run into is 46, where we are suddenly told that the uh, body is the foam of a wave. What does this foam look like? It is fleeting, it bubbles up, it is frothing. Recall the quotes from physicists who've read about quantum reality being frothing, effervescent, bubbling reality. Uh, it is white and brilliant, like light, and it is composed of bubbles which are basically invisible and they only reflect and or emanate light and so on. This sounds quite a bit like nirvana quantum reality. <coughs> uh, so if I look at the body or if I look at the wall or if I look at you know this color red right here or something, that's uh, you know that's the an illusion or what is actually there is some sort of uh, foamy, bubbling reality. Now this, the, the parallels to quantum physics are extraordinary here. Uh, we saw, I read it to you twice, the Paul Davies. He's a, um, we, he were, we read him last class. We, saw, we read twice the passage from him 